So we've been staying so far in continuous time, right? And so now we want to get to some stuff that you probably haven't seen in the previous class, which is the discrete time Fourier transform. So from now on, we're really mostly interested in signals that are, um, you know, discrete time, not continuous. So let's remember, um, you know, the continuous time Fourier transform. which sometimes they may abbreviate like CTFT, just to be super clear. Um, so we talked about that in the previous couple lectures as being this integral. And this was when I had a uh, continuous time signal, X of T, right? But what I want to know now is how can I deal with a signal that is not continuous, but instead is represented like these kinds of, you know, sticks of different heights, what we call x of n, okay, where we assume that these sticks are indexed by integers. So our intuition is that what I want to do is I want to turn the integral into a sum, right? So instead of integrating over all the continuous values of x of t, I sum over all the discrete values. And in fact, that is true. So we can define the discrete time Fourier transform, or DTFT, as, I should have given myself a little more space here. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's, that's good. It's still a function of frequency, omega. And instead of an integral, I have an infinite sum. Okay, so there's no more dt because I've got a discrete time sum. Okay. So this is still a continuous function of omega, right? So I haven't, you know, made the frequency domain discrete. Right now that's still continuous also. Okay. And so like I alluded to on the first couple of days of class. There is a difference though, right? Because here, for the continuous time Fourier transform, we can have frequencies that are arbitrarily high, right? We can make cosines that are arbitrarily wiggly. And so I could have a cosine 5,000 hertz, a cosine of 10,000 hertz, a cosine of 100,000 hertz, right? That's not a problem for continuous time. But in discrete time, it turns out that we only have a fixed set of frequencies. So why is that? So what I was saying earlier just now is continuous time Fourier transforms have a frequency range that is basically unlimited. But discrete time Fourier transforms have a frequency range of width 2 pi. And why is that? Well, if I take my definition and I plug in 2 pi plus some arbitrary omega, what I have is this sum, e to the minus j omega, and I guess I should say omega plus 2 pi times m. And so I can pull out this guy here e to the minus j omega n, and then I have this e to the minus j 2 pi m, right? And the thing you remember here is that n is an integer. And I think about where that complex number is on the unit circle, and it's always right here, right? So this is like 0, then I go around once, that's 2 pi, I go around twice, that's 4 pi, and so on. So no matter what n is, this number always reduces to 1, and this here is just x omega. And so perhaps it would be more accurate to say that the DTFT can be evaluated for any omega, but it's 2 pi periodic. Okay, so if I were to think about the DTFT, what it would look like would generally be something that looks like this, where I have repeated copies of whatever is happening in the middle every 
two pi units, right? So what happens in practice is that we usually restrict our attention to this range between minus pi and pi, and only draw the DTFT inside this two pi wide interval, with the understanding that the DTFT actually has copies out at other omegas, okay? And again, one of the reasons why we choose uh, minus pi and pi as the boundaries is that if I think about what is, you know, e to the j pi n, right? That's cosine pi n plus j sine pi n, right? And again, I think about where that complex number is, right? So when uh, n is 0, I'm over here. When n is 1, I'm over here. When n is 2, I'm over here. So basically, I'm bouncing back and forth between plus or minus 1. Right? So this is basically going to be plus or minus 1. Or a more accurate way to say it would be saying like minus 1 to the n power. Right? And if I draw that signal, it looks like something that alternates between plus and minus 1 as fast as it can go. And so in some sense, this is the highest frequency discrete time signal that I can create, right? So it kind of stands to reason that I draw my boundary edges at plus or minus pi. As we're going to talk about in just a second, um, there are some symmetries that when everything is real, I often just draw from zero to pi because I know that I can predict what the left-hand side looks like given the right-hand side. Okay. So any questions about that? So let's talk about how to go backwards, right? So I mean, I told you kind of what the forward Fourier transform is of a discrete time signal. How would I go back and get the discrete time signal from the Fourier transform? Well, let's again think about what does the uh, continuous time inverse Fourier transform look like? Well, there was basically a integral from minus infinity to infinity, x of omega e to the j omega t d omega, right? And actually, there was a 1 over 2 pi out here, right? So what is the intuition for what the inverse should look like? Well, I would kind of hope that um, by analogy, I hope it kind of looks like the same kind of thing. 1 over 2 pi, except instead of integrating between minus infinity and infinity, I only integrate over one period of the DTFT, because otherwise I'd get infinity. <coughs> so this would be my hope. And in fact, that's what turns out to be true, right? So let me, I'll just prove why that's true, OK? So let me just consider the inside integral. So proof. Um, let's consider this integral, x of omega e to the j omega n d omega. OK. So now I'm going to plug in my forward DTFT formula, right? So I'm going to say that's equal to this integral, x of omega. And then I defined the, I'm sorry x omega equals this. I'm going to use m here instead of n because I've got an n here already. And so for the purposes of this expression, n is already some fixed number. So I need to use a different variable here as my dummy summation variable. OK. And so now what I would like to be able to do is to switch the integral and the sum, OK? Now, this is not a class on real analysis, but suffice to say that you can't always just arbitrarily switch the orders of integrals and sums. And so one sufficient condition that I'm going to tell you is that a sufficient condition to switch the order is that if I sum up all of the values of the absolute value of x, I get something that converges, right? 
And so this may actually bring back some memories from maybe Calculus 2 when you talked about series and convergence of series and stuff like that. I need to know, okay, so when I add up sums, when I have an infinite series, what do the terms have to satisfy for me to get an answer, right? So you probably spent two or three weeks on this when you took calculus way back when, okay? So this is one sufficient condition for the sum to converge. And so in that case, I can say that this integral equals the sum of these integrals minus pi pi e to the j omega n minus m d omega. Okay. And so now I can stop and say, okay, well, this guy here is kind of like an integral that we had to do before when we were deriving the Fourier series, right? We were kind of saying, well, if I'm integrating a exponential, which I could decompose this into, you know, this is like this integral, cosine omega n minus m plus j sine omega n minus m d omega, right? Let's think about the cosine. When, when n minus m equals zero, what I have is this integral from minus pi to pi of one d omega, which equals two pi. When n minus m is not equal to zero, what I have is the integral from minus pi to pi of a signal that basically between this region is wiggling, you know, like this, or wiggling, you know, an integer number of times inside this interval. And so the point is that inside these integrals where n is not equal to m, I always have as much above the line as I have below the line. So all these integrals turn into zero when n is not equal to m. And so that means that this whole thing here basically turns into, you know, zero most of the time for almost all of the values of the sum at zero. The only time that it's not equal to zero is when n equals m. In that case, the integral is equal to two pi, and I can turn this whole integral into, I can turn this whole thing here into two pi times the one place where n equals m. And that's exactly where I wanted to get to, because if I look at where I started, I was looking at this thing, and I wanted to show that this integral here equaled two pi times x of n. And so that's where I got to in the end, okay? So just to kind of put it all together, the DTFT is kind of characterized by the forward and the inverse, right? So the DTFT, to get the forward one, I take x omega is this infinite sum. And to go backwards, I do this integral over one period of the DTFT. Okay. So, questions or comments? So one thing I want to start doing is drawing connections between all the Fourier transforms that we've learned about so far, right? And so this here actually should look kind of familiar, right? Because this looks a lot like how I would compute the Fourier series of something, right? So suppose that I had a signal, a periodic signal, where the period was 2 pi, and let's just say it looks like a Fourier series expansion. for a signal with period 2 pi, right? Because what is that Fourier series? It's AK, the sum, basically over some region, my X of T, E to the minus J. Uh, then I have my kind of 2 pi over T, which turns into 1, K, Omega, uh, kt, right, dt, right? That's the way that I would compute the Fourier series expansion of some continuous time signal 
that had period 2 pi, right? And so I can see that actually this looks a lot like this, right? So I have the same kind of 1 over t, I have this integral, I have a continuous time signal here that's periodic, and then I have this e to the j some integer t dt. And so actually that's exactly what is happening here. And so one way to think about the relationship between the DTFT and the Fourier series is saying, okay, what if I were to take my, you know, what if I were to take my signal? So here's my original discrete time signal, right? This has some DTFT that is 2 pi periodic. And so I can kind of draw, again, I'm just going to kind of sketch it out here. Right? And the idea would be that if I take this 2, peri 2 pi periodic signal and I go backwards and I compute the Fourier series of this, these AKs are basically what I get. Another way of thinking about this is that if I were to convert this into a impulse train where the heights of these impulses were the same heights as the discrete dots, right? So this is like turning it into a weighted impulse train. But if I were to take the uh, Basically, if I was to take the inverse continuous time Fourier transform, what I would get would be, again, the same thing here, right? We proved that before. We were saying, you know, usually when I take the Fourier transform of something, I insist that when I integrate it, I get a finite number, right? Here, if I was to do this integral, I would get uh, infinity because I'm summing up an infinite number of copies of stuff. But we made an exception for periodic signals. And in those cases, we said that if I were to take the Fourier transform of this, what I would get would be a impulse train where the heights of the impulses were the Fourier series coefficients. Okay. And so, you know, all this Fourier stuff is basically kind of tied up together, right? There's not kind of like saying this is one entity and this is another entity. They're really kind of all the same thing under the hood. It's just a different way of thinking about where they represent signals with sticks or with delta functions in continuous time or discrete time. So that's kind of the idea. I mean, there is a little bit of a, you know, uh, there was a sign flip over here. Like if you compare this to this, there's a negative here and a positive here. But that's just kind of a convention as to which way I define forward and inverse. So it's not really a substantive difference. OK. So comments or questions about this? And again, so I'm not going to talk about it right now. And actually, what I decided to do, and I see it's the way I said it in the syllabus, <coughs> is that I'm going to talk about the Z transform next. So next week, we'll talk about Z and uh, you know, solving linear time systems with Z. And then I'll come up just before the exam and talk about the fourth missing piece. So, right, so far, what we've talked about is if I have, um, I kind of like to make this table where I have on this side, um, I have a continuous or a discrete signal, and then I have either a periodic or a non-periodic signal, right? So we kind of already showed that when I have a continuous periodic signal, I take the Fourier series. When I have a continuous non-periodic signal, I take the Fourier transform, okay? And so we just kind of showed here was if I have a discrete non-periodic signal, I have the discrete time Fourier transform. And then we have yet to fill in this part of the square, which is basically going to be the discrete Fourier transform. So this is going to be, we're going to do this after we do the Z transform. But by the time we come up to the first exam, you guys are going to know about all four pieces of the square. Okay. So this is a little bit confusing, right? There's DTFT and DFT, right? It's 
poor notation, but um, at some point, you know, I may, so after we get into the class a little bit more, I'm probably going to start just dropping the DT from this, and, and it will be implied that if I'm talking about a discrete time signal, then of course we're doing the DTFT, right? Um, so I may just start calling it the Fourier transform with the understanding that you know which one is continuous, which one is discrete. Okay. So I wanted to say a couple of little things about um, when the Fourier, when the DTFT works. Okay. So we mentioned that um, if I have this convergence property, then we have what I would call, you know, really good convergence. What that means is that the limit, so this is a little bit of a mathematical notation that not all you guys are going to know, but let me just put it down here for a second. So soup here is basically like the maximum value of the signal. What this means is that um, as n gets big, x of omega, or x n of omega, which is going to be like this partial sum where I only add up a finite amount of these things. In a way, that's like adding up only a finite amount of Fourier series terms is kind of one way to think about that. You know, this converges at each point to the actual value. So it's kind of like saying that, you know, if I tell you, okay, I want to have the true x of, x, I, want, I want to have the approximation of my Fourier transform to be as close as possible to the true thing, I will get there if I add up enough terms at every point, right? There's a kind of a looser condition that says that um, if I have this instead, right? This is kind of a looser condition. What I mean by that is that there are signals that satisfy this that don't satisfy that. Then what I have instead is that the limit as n goes to infinity of this integral goes to zero. So kind of what this means instead is that it may not be true at every point exactly, but the difference, the integral of difference between the true thing and the approximation gets smaller and smaller. And so kind of one of the reasons for that is related to like the Gibbs phenomenon thing we talked about last time. So basically if I have, for example, uh, the way that the Gibbs phenomenon approximates the square wave, right, there's always that little shoulder that's left, that 9% height difference that I can't really get rid of. And so that violates this condition, right? Because I'm always, for some point, going to be 9% away of what I actually want to be, right? But if I were to integrate the difference between the square wave and that Gibbs phenomenon approximation, the integral of that difference gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The shoulder gets narrower and narrower, so when I integrate that difference, it gets smaller and smaller. So this is what you would call mean square convergence, which is a little bit not as good as, as this. OK. So what I want to do is a few examples, OK, to make all this a little bit more concrete. Because so far, we're just kind of slinging formulas around. OK. So let's start out with um, the pulse in the frequency domain. What does that correspond to in the time domain? So here I'm going to draw this pulse, which is kind of also like a low-pass filter, right? That's another name that we would give it. And so what would be the corresponding time domain signal? Well, I'm going to apply my formula. And I'm going to plug in. So this is going to basically be uh, one between the two frequencies like this and zero everywhere else. 
And this is not such a bad integral to do. What I get is 1 over 2 pi j n e to the j omega n over, or I guess I get like this, right? And so I plug this in, and I get 1 over 2 pi j n uh, e to the j omega cutoff m e to the minus j omega cutoff m. And I can kind of immediately identify that, hey, you know, this is going to be a sign. Right? This is like uh, 1 over pi n times sine of omega cutoff n. And a different way of saying that is I have omega cutoff over pi times sinc of omega cutoff n. And so again, this is kind of like what we were expecting. right? A pulse in one domain corresponds to a sinc in the other domain. So we're going to talk about, um, and, and this actually illustrates kind of what I was talking about before, is that you know this signal, right, is you know this satisfies um, that the sum of the squared is less than infinity, but not that the sum of the absolute value is less than infinity. And so what I get if I kind of consider these partial approximations in the time domain, if, like I, if I kind of start from the middle and kind of add x of n terms, what I'll get in the frequency domain kind of looks like the Gibbs phenomenon over here. So what I'll get is something that looks like a approximate filter, and then I'll have you know, something like this. And again, the fact that there's always this little guy here means that I don't converge at every point, but I do get something that's closer and closer. You know, eventually I'll get something that looks like, you know, this. So the integral difference between this and the square wave gets smaller and smaller. So I get convergence in that sense. Okay. So actually, maybe it would make more sense to go back and do some much more basic examples. So let's let's talk about. Um, you know, the standard things. So what happens if I have a delta function? So if I have a delta function in the time domain, well, in the frequency domain, I have this sum, e to the minus j omega n. The only time that this delta function fires is at n equals 0. So there's only one term in the sum, actually. And that corresponds to n equals 0 when e to the 0 is 1. So basically, I have this as equal to 1. And so again, our old intuition is the same, where I have you know, delta function in the time domain corresponds to a constant value of 1 in the frequency domain. Um, well, what if I go the other way around? What if? Uh, x of omega is the delta function. Okay. Just to be clear, though, we can't actually have a delta function sitting alone at 0 in the same way that we had for the continuous time Fourier transform, because everything in the discrete time frequency domain world has to be periodic. And so really, when I say that, what I mean is that I have a delta function that repeats every 2 pi units. Right? That's something I can talk about because it's periodic. And so I can ask, what is the inverse Fourier transform of this repeating signal? Well, I would do this integral, minus pi to pi, of x to omega e to the j omega n. Again, this delta function fires at omega equals 0 inside the interval of integration that I care about. And so that means I'm going to plug in n equals 0. This, again, I get 1, right? So I get. 1 over 2 pi. And so the inverse Fourier transform of this is a constant for all m, just like I would want. And the height of that constant is you know, 1 over 2 pi. So it's still true that you know, a, de a delta function in one domain corresponds to a constant in the other domain. I just have to be a little bit careful with what I mean by a delta function in this world, right? because it's no longer just a delta function sitting by itself. So questions about this. 
So another thing that we see all the time is exponentials, right? And so if we have an exponential that looks like this, and again, the reason that I'm uh, saying it this way is that I want something that satisfies my rule about uh, being able to sum up the values, right? So if I have an exponential that is decaying, and it's zero over here, I know that this is a valid signal to sum up, right? We already know what the infinite sum formula for this signal would look like. So that satisfies my rule. That should mean I could take a Fourier transform of it. And now if I plug in my formula, I'm going to actually need to use that rule. Um, I guess I'll just kind of put it in here. So that means that my sum turns into 0 to infinity, a to the n, e to the minus j omega n. And this is written in a different way as a e to the minus j omega taken to the n power. And now I use my infinite sum formula to say that since each one of these terms has a magnitude of less than 1, right? That's my requirement to use this formula. I have this guy here. Right? So this is a complex function, right? So again, one thing to remember is that even though I may have a real signal, I end up with complex Fourier transforms, right? But we can look at the magnitude and the phase of this complex function to get a sense of what the filter is doing, right? And so let's think about, um, you know, sometimes what we look at is that the magnitude response which is defined as the absolute value or the magnitude of this complex function, and the phase response, this angle, right? These are kind of, you know, complementary ways of looking at what this filter is doing, right? So let's think about what that means. Well, let's just look at the magnitude response for a second, because that's really what defines the character of the filter. Is it low pass, is it high pass, whatever. So what I want to know is, what is the magnitude response? Well, it's the magnitude of this complex function. And again, A is going to be some real number. So I'm going to expand out this guy into uh, 1 minus A cosine uh, omega. That's the real part, plus J a, I guess I have a, yeah, sine omega. Because this minus and this minus cancel each other out. And I'm going to, so that's, that's this complex number. So my magnitude is going to be equal to 1 over the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. And I can kind of think about what that looks like, right? So when omega is equal to 0, so when omega is equal to 0, I get this part is 0. This part is 1 minus a squared square root. So this, this height here is 1 over 1 minus a. And so since a is some number that's less than 1, this is some number that's greater than 1. And then as omega gets bigger, this number, gets, this number is going to get smaller, this number is going to get bigger. When I arrive at pi, what I'm going to have is uh, 1 plus a over here squared, and I'm going to have a 0 again over here. So I'm kind of going to have a function that looks like this, that starts out high and dips down, not to 0, but to this value like this. And so this basically looks like you know, a crude low-pass filter, because stuff in the middle is getting passed through, and stuff at the edges is getting attenuated. Okay. I'm going to say more about the magnitude and the phase responses in just a few minutes. But let me ask if there are any questions about how I kind of got to this point. So it's a good practice to be able to think about how to draw magnitude and phase responses by looking at the absolute values of these complex numbers, right? 
So let's talk about the, um, you know, I, I talked about how a pulse in the frequency domain corresponded to a sync in the time domain, right? So what does a pulse in the time domain look like? So a pulse in the time domain. So let's suppose that to make things easier, I center this pulse. So I'm going to say it's just going to be between minus m and plus m for some integer m. And that's going to be 0 everywhere else. So my Fourier transform of this is going to be the sum of the values of the signal, e to the minus j omega n. Here I'm going to have only uh, 2m plus 1 uh, non-zero elements, each of which is going to be of height 1, let's say. And what I can do to make this a little bit easier is I can take out a uh, e to the j omega capital M. That's like saying that I can instead start my sum at 0 and go up to 2m. Right? This is just a little bit of a mathematical trick because this is like saying that you know, when n equals 0, I get e to the j 2 capital M. When n equals 2m, I get basically e to the j omega minus capital M. So basically, I'm getting the same terms in the sum. I'm just kind of reordering them. Because now, this is something that I know the answer to because it's a finite sum. So I can use my finite sum formula to get that this is like 1 minus e to the minus j omega to the 2m plus 1 over 1 minus e to the minus j omega. Right? This is a you know, finite sum formula expression. So now let's think about this for a second. So actually, let's think about this here before I went to this formula. So when omega equals 0, when omega equals 0, this is just like adding up a bunch of these terms here, right? So that's like saying I'm adding up from minus m to m of a bunch of 1s, right? So my x omega here is going to be 2m plus 1. The reason that I mention this is because when omega equals 0 here, I kind of get a 0 over 0, and I'm not sure what to do with it. So I'm just kind of laying this aside. So let's suppose that omega is not equal to 0, and let's see if I can simplify this a little bit more. So this is going to be a little bit of a mathematical trick again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to keep my e to the j omega m out here. And then in the bottom, I'm going to take out a uh, e to the minus j omega over 2. And then what this turns into is this. And you can kind of see the reason I'm doing this is to make this look more like what I need to create a sign. Right? So by taking out kind of halfway between these two things, I kind of get this sign. So this is like a professor's trick. In the same way, I'm going to take out half of what I saw up here. And I'm going to get another thing that looks like this. And now I'm going to say, OK, well, if I were to actually add up all these exponents, I would have an m plus a half between these guys. And here's my m plus a half over here. So all this stuff here cancels out to 1. And what I get is here, this looks like basically sine of omega 2m plus 1 over 2. And this looks like sine uh, omega over 2. 
and then I'm done, right? Because the two J's that I would normally have hanging around here cancel each other out. So I kind of got to a weird point here, right? Because, you know, here, this does not look like a sync function, right? I kind of drilled into you all the time that a pulse converts to a sync, right? But here I don't get something, I mean, I got something that kind of looked like it was going that way and then it didn't happen, right? Why didn't it happen? Well, remember that whatever I do in the discrete time Fourier transform world has to be periodic, right? And a sync function is not periodic. So if I were to draw what this function looks like, it kind of looks like this. So between 2 pi and pi, this is going to be my poor artist rendition. I guess if I was smart, I could do this in MATLAB. So what it kind of looks like is something like this, where it's kind of the closest I can get to making a periodic version of the sync function. It kind of looks like what I would get if I took sync functions, shifted them to be centered at multiples of 2 pi, and added all that stuff up, right? And in some sense, that's exactly what is happening, right? And so if I were to look for a closed form expression for that summation, that sign over sign that I have on the previous page is what I would get, right? So the, in the intuition is still good. The intuition is still that a pulse converts to a sync, but the kind of sync that I get in the frequency domain has to necessarily be a little bit modified to make it periodic. So that's why the functional form is a little bit different. But if you were to look at the picture, it still kind of gives you that sinky feeling. Okay. So comments or questions on that? Okay, so let me um, let me say a few words about uh, again why we care about these kinds of D DTFTs of impulse responses, right? Because all we want to do in this course is analyze how systems operate on signals, and so usually the first signal that we're going to take the DTFT of is going to be the impulse response of whatever system that we're thinking about, and so let's remember that. Um, you know, we want to use the DTFT to study LTI linear time invariant systems. So let's remember, well, so, so let's prove um, that, you know, our convolution property still holds. So let me prove why that's true. So let's say that I have y of n is going to be x of n convolved with h of n, right? And again, this is convolution in the easy way, right? So if we're going to do like the WASD convolution array method or the infinite sum method, right? This is the kind of convolution that we need to do in this class for discrete time signals. And so let's think about what is the DTFT of this sky. Well, I'm just going to follow my nose and plug in. And luckily, this, this kind of proof is a lot easier. So now I'm going to say, okay, this Y is actually a convolution sum where I have X of K, H of N minus K, and now I have this e to the minus j omega n. Now I'm going to move the sums around. And I'm going to take this x of k out here. And then I'm going to take this guy and say h of n minus k e to minus j omega n. So what I'm going to do is a quick change of variables to say, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm summing up all the values of h multiplied by some exponential. So I'm just going to rename, you know, this guy to be this. That means that what I have here is, I guess I have to go to a different page. That means what I have here is um, the sum here and the sum here. I have h of m e to the 
minus j omega m plus k. And now I can say, okay, well, I can take the m part, leave it here, take the k part, move it over here. And now I can actually just totally split up these integrals, or these sums, rather. And this is exactly the definition of the Fourier transform of x, and this is exactly the transformation, Fourier transform of h. Right? So I got where I wanted to get. Right? I showed that the output Fourier transform was the product of the input Fourier transform and the, and the frequency response. Right? So all my nice you know, kinds of intuition about how to use LTI systems still comes through for the discrete time world. Okay? And I also just want to redo what I did last time in terms of thinking about, okay, what is the intuition for the frequency response? The frequency response is what takes every subcomponent frequency of the input and modulates it by some amplification or attenuation and shifts it by some phase, right? So that's the intuition is that the value of the frequency response at some fixed frequency tells me how our cosines and sines of that frequency getting moved around, right? So let's make sure that that, start, that part is still true. So let's suppose that I have an input signal that is some amplitude times a complex exponential at some frequency, okay? So what happens when I put that through my system? Well, this is the convolution when I have my arbitrary impulse response. Again, I'm going to write down what the convolution means here. It means h of k times this thing summed up over k. And I can plug in, what do I know about x? Well, it's a e to the j omega 0 n minus k. And now I can pull out this a e to the j omega 0 n. And then I have this thing here. And again, this is exactly what I defined as the frequency response evaluated at omega zero. So this is like saying I take h of omega zero e to the minus e to this, right? So that's like saying that if this complex exponential comes in, what comes out is the very same thing multiplied by this complex number, which is the frequency response evaluated at that frequency, right? And to make it even more explicit, what happens is, you know, if I put this signal through the system, what comes out is an amplitude scaling and a phase shifting. Right? So this basically is um, you know, amplitude scaling. And this is basically like phase shifting. OK. And so I want to make sure that this kind of key concept is, is with you. And kind of in the same way, you know, we can prove that um, you know, in the same way. And since we kind of did this for the continuous sine Fourier transfer, I'm not going to explicitly prove it here. But in the same way, if I have a cosine, a real valued cosine that has some frequency and phase, what comes out of the system is the same kind of amplitude scaling times this cosine at the same frequency plus a phase shift. I should also say if h of n is real, that is an important caveat here, which is true most of the time, right? So again, what I get when I put the cosine in is the same cosine coming out with this amplitude scaling and this phase shifting. And so 
Same thing I said before. I can't introduce new frequencies into the system with an LTI system, right? The only thing I can do is take the frequencies that I have and amplify or attenuate them and move them around, right? So um, again, a good trick question is always, you know, is it possible for an LTI system to do this? And you look and see whether frequencies have been introduced, and you can automatically say, no, that system can't be the LTI. Right? OK. So what I want to do briefly is kind of talk about um, the magnitude and the phase. Actually, before I do that, let me just do one little example of this. I'm not going to carry it all the way up, but just so you get the sense of how it works. Right? So suppose that I give you um, this is my impulse response, kind of your standard looking exponential, and this is my signal. Okay. And then I ask you what is the output. Okay. So here, the first thing that you should recognize before you start looking into the table is, oh, this is really only a single sinusoid, right? At the frequency, you know, pi over three, right? So all I need to know is what is happening in the frequency response at pi over three, okay? And so here, I would look at my table and I would find out that this frequency response is what we just figured out earlier in lecture. And so I would plug in pi over 3 to get this. And again, I would look on the circle, and I would say, OK, that means that this is a half. This is square root of 3 over 2. And so what I have is 1 over 1 minus a third. I guess, actually, it's, it's on the other place. So I have 1 half minus square root of 3 over 2j. And so what I have is 1 over uh, 5 sixths plus square root of 3 over 6j, right? And then I would figure out, OK, what is the magnitude of this number? And what is the angle of this number? And that would just multiply this and this. So my result would be basically 2 times whatever this turned out to be, times e to the j pi over 3n plus the angle of this thing evaluated, right? So all you do to solve this problem is to figure out the magnitude and phase of this single complex number, right? There's no need to, there's no, there's no need to take the x into the frequency domain and figure anything out, right? All I do is, is observe that when I have a pure combination of cosines and sines in the input that I can only get attenuated or amplified versions of those pure cosines and sines in the output, right? So kind of watch for those kinds of problems when you do exams and homework. You know, kind of think before you go immediately to the table, where is the signal in the table? Think for a second about, okay, what is really happening with this system? That's kind of a good policy. Okay, so questions about this example? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about magnitude and phase, because I feel like a lot of times in uh, signals types of classes, you pay more attention to the magnitude and, and less attention to the phase. So we look at the magnitude response. And again, Oftentimes, uh, I'm not going to, you know, I think that after you see it a couple times, all the asymmetry and, you know, time shifting and so on properties get a little tedious. All those kinds of similar properties carry over for the TFT, and you can find a table in the book that tells you exactly how all that stuff works. Um, one of those properties is that when, um, when h of t is real, I'm sorry, h of n is real, as is often the case, the magnitude response is even. And what that means is that oftentimes I only plot the magnitude response 
between 0 and pi, with the understanding that 0 represents the lowest frequency, which is dc, and pi represents the highest frequency, which is that cosine that's alternating up and down all the time. And so you'll see pictures that look like you know this, where this is the magnitude response. The phase response, so when h of n is real, the angle, the phase response is odd. And so for example, if I have a phase response that looks like this, it must continue off to the other side like that. So oftentimes you'll only plot the phase response for, again, this positive value, but it doesn't go off this way, it goes off continuing reflecting mirror-wise around here. And so I drew this as a straight line because that's a desirable thing. I'm going to tell you why that's true in just a second. But again, just in terms of terminology, we talked about names for different filters. And so let me just remind you again the kinds of filters that we care about. So usually the filters are classified according to what their magnitude response looks like. And so you sometimes see these called like ideal filters. So we already talked about the low pass filter. And again, whenever I draw this picture, I have to keep in mind that now the world of frequencies is really bounded in this 2 pi y interval, right? And in some sense, that's nice because, you know, now there's an upper bound on how high the frequency can get, right? Whereas in continuous time, there is no such upper bound. Maybe it's harder to define what you mean by middle frequency, right? Here it's a little bit more explicit because we can put lower bounds and upper bounds on the frequency band. So this is what you would call a low pass filter. And I have a cutoff frequency, omega c. And kind of the opposite of that is a high pass filter that looks like this. So here, this is something that is chopping out lower frequencies and retaining higher frequencies. So this is high pass. And then you could do things like, you know, just keep a little section of the frequency band. This is called band pass. Or you can do a band stop filter where you basically keep everything except for a little narrow area. And then you can do what's called an all pass filter. which means that the frequency content isn't getting changed, but the phases of the individual cosines and sines are getting changed, right? So you may think that this is like a useless filter, but what is happening under the hood is that the phases of things are getting changed, and that can be very important. And so as we're going to talk about in some detail after the exam, you know, you can never really, with a finite impulse response, with a, with a, num with a set of h of n's that is only non-zero for a finite number of n's, you can never really get exactly filters that look like this. The only thing that you can do is get kind of approximations that come as close as possible. We're going to talk about different ways of designing those approximations uh, at some length. Okay, so why did I why did I take this picture of the phase and draw it like it was a straight line, right? So let's talk for a second about um, you know phase response. And just say, you know, why is this phase response being, say, you know, a linear function desirable? Where this C is just some constant. Well, let's say that the magnitude is piecewise constant. Right? So all the pictures I drew here are piecewise constant, right? Either it's one in the pass band or it's zero in the stop band, right? So then um, in the 
you know, pass region, my frequency response of the output is going to be the, I'm sorry, the Fourier transform of the output is going to be the Fourier transform of the input times the frequency response. And to make this explicit, this is like this. Oops. Right, I'm just decomposing it into magnitude and phase. And if this is constant, then let's suppose it's just one. Then the magnitude is unchanged, and what I have is e to the minus j c omega for a linear phase filter. Right? What that means is that the angle of h of omega is minus c of omega. And now I look at this and I say, okay, well, this is basically just a phase shift in the frequency domain. And so you can prove that this is corresponding to a delay in the time domain. And so this is good, right? Because this just means that when I apply this linear phase filter to a signal, all I'm really doing is delaying the output, OK? And so that's good, right? Because in some sense, what's happening is all of the cosines and sines are getting delayed by the same amount. So it's not like considered to be distortion of the signal, right? If all the cosines and sines that were making up the signal were being delayed at different rates, then my output signal would sound very weird, right? But if everything is shifting at the same rate, all I'm doing is delaying the whole thing. And that's a good thing, right? So this is basically saying, you know, um, you know, a pure delay of the input, which is not considered as distortion. And so you might ask, okay, well, why don't I just like if, if I'm going to be delaying the signal, why don't I just have zero delay all the time, right? Like, I want to basically not have any shifting at all. So, um, why can't we have just zero delay? Well, we already kind of showed that if I have, for example, a low pass filter. We already kind of showed that if this was my filter in the time domain, and when I have zero delay, that means that you know normally I draw this with a magnitude like this, but if there's zero delay, the magnitude is the same thing as the actual filter. Uh, we showed that the corresponding time domain signal was basically this sync function. And again, if I think about what that looks like, it looks like something that, number one, goes on infinitely, but more importantly, oops, has these negative values, right? So all this stuff means that the filter is non-causal. And also some other factors are the fact that, you know, this filter is not absolutely summable. Right? That means that the sum of this equals infinity, which means that the filter is not stable. We didn't talk about stability yet. We're going to talk about more about that later. But just suffice it to say that that's bad. And also, it's infinitely long. Right? So there are lots of reasons why I can't take this low-pass filter ideally and get it to actually work in a physical system because my impulse response is not very desirable. Right? However, as it turns out, I can make a nice impulse response that comes pretty close to this and has linear phase, which means that all I'm doing is really doing a nice filtering of the signal and only delaying the output, right? So that kind of stands to reason, right? So I mean, what it means is that if I want to filter a signal, I have to tolerate a little bit of delay in my output, right? So that's fine because like if you put a CD into your stereo, right, there's no guarantee that 
the bits that are getting read off the CD are getting to you in real time, right? You don't know how much delay is built into that system. It doesn't really matter to you, right? Same with your MP3 player and so on, right? Okay, and I think that probably as we get uh, more, so some, some of these guys who do like audio processing could probably say more about what makes good filters and delays and stuff like that. So they, we may ask you to come up and talk about, you know, what makes good impulse responses from an audio processing point of view. Okay, so that's kind of the, you know, the one class whirlwind world, world introduction to the DTFT. If, if I hadn't done all of the continuous time stuff earlier, I probably would have drilled down a lot more into proving all the properties and so on. But I think that after you've seen the continuous time stuff first, you can see why this discrete time thing just kind of follows on, right? And so what we're going to talk about next is the Z transform, which is kind of number one, a generalization of VTFT. And so you may have seen a little bit of the Z transform in a single class. Um, but we're going to get more into it here. And number two, the Z transform is kind of like a generalization or a discrete time version of the Laplace transform, which you probably used a ton in classes like DiffieQ and signals to solve differential equations in LTI systems. And uh, that's going to take us almost to the first exam. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the discrete time, uh, well, the discrete time version of the Fourier series, which is called the DFT. And then we're going to have the exam. And then after the exam, we have been able to kind of lay all the groundwork for the, the fundamental tools that we need to analyze LTI systems. And then we start to, get, then we get to the good stuff where we're actually going to do a lot of stuff that you haven't ever seen before. Things like, you know, how do I efficiently compute these Fourier transforms? How do I design adaptive filters? How do I design filters in the first place that aren't adaptive, right? So I guarantee that after the first exam, it won't look like review material anymore. You'll be really getting into some stuff that you haven't seen. Okay, so any questions or comments. So let me shut this down. So like I said, just as a note, um, 